From the television studios of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., this is Ask Congress with Lester Wolf. Welcome once again to Ask Congress. Uh, how many times have you been asked to write your congressman to in some way influence his or her vote or to find out uh, how they might react to a particular issue in which you're interested? Well, today uh, we're going to give you the answers you've been writing about, or the answers to the questions you've been writing about. At least I'm going to act as your surrogate and pose questions to two important members of the United States Congress, one a new member. Uh, the other, a more senior member who has, just because of his new position, become one of the most influential members here in the Congress of the United States. We'll be back in just a moment with Congressman Mickey Leland of Texas and Congressman Joseph Diaguardi uh, of New York, the gentleman who's just been recently elected as uh, chairman of the Black Caucus in the Congress, uh, Congressman Mickey Leland of Texas. Uh, Congressman Leland uh, serves on the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, the Health and the Environment, Telecommunications Subcommittee, the District of Columbia Committee, and the Post Office and Civil Service uh, Committee, Chairman of Postal uh, Personnel, and the Select Committee on Children, Youth, and Families. What are you doing in your spare time, Mickey? <laughs> <laughs> I go on television shows. <laughs> oh, I see. And seated next to him is a new congressman, uh, uh, just elected uh, from the state of New York, uh, Congressman Joe Diaguati of New York's 20th district and uh, the rumor hath it and probably by the time the program is shown you'll be a member of the government operations uh, committee and, and the small business committee and that fits in pretty well with your background doesn't it? It does Les. Nice to be here by the way. Well uh, you are you know uh, from time to time on, on this program uh, we have uh, a number of people, uh, most of whom in the Congress are, are lawyers and today we're, we're faced with a, a situation, a, a new development so to speak uh, we've got you, uh, Joe, and you're a uh, certified public accountant. That's right, and I'm told uh, at this point there are uh, three CPAs uh, in Congress. Uh -huh. I know of one other, Ron Flippo, I believe uh -huh. he's on the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and I think it's time that the accounting profession, uh, specifically certified public accountants, took a bigger role in government, not only in the legislative process here in Washington, but even at the local levels because of the problems that the cities are having today, uh, balancing their, their books, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more planning, and I think uh, it's, it's right to have uh, CPA stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other professions in, the, in this process. And you, uh, Mickey, are, are a pharmacist. That's correct. You know, it, it reminds me of, of the, the days in the, the, when they drafted people into the service, and uh, when you were a, a pharmacist, they put you in as a paratrooper or something like that. Now. <laughs> Here you are, a, 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 a pharmacist serving in the Congress, and one of the principal areas that you have been interested in, as I understand it, has been the, the area overall of hunger. That's correct, Les. Uh, as you know, we created last year the Select Committee on Hunger, and the Speaker was kind enough to appoint me as chairman of that Select Committee. So my pursuits uh, have served uh, in the highest priority in that arena, and I'm very, very happy about uh, some of the things that we've done thus far. Uh, as hunger in children too, is it? Uh, well, I was not. Uh, I was on the select committee on children, youth, and families. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I asked the speaker if I was, w if he would consider appointing me as chairman of the select committee on hunger, I had to forego uh, that committee. Uh, George I see. Miller is the chairman of that committee, yes. and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very substantial and very credible committee, I might add, and, and it has done a lot to bring forth, forth the problems of children youth and families and I'm very proud to have served on that committee but now I have a new charge my charge is to uh, analyze the circumstances of the hunger problems hunger and malnutrition both in uh, in this country our domestic interest and also in the world and if, as you know Lester there have been some very severe problems on the continent of Africa more specifically about 35 to 40 million people are at risk right now of dying of starvation uh, I just recently came back from Ethiopia where the problem is most severe and in the most massive numbers than any other country in the world. And uh, our committee is, is committed to trying to do as much as we can to offer the kind of support that Congress can give uh, to help to ameliorate the problem. Well, one of the problems I'm, I'm sure that you'll be faced with, and as a man who's good with figures, uh, Joe, is the fact that... Uh, we've got to cut back on some of our expenditures. And one of the areas that always seems to be a target uh, is foreign aid. Mm -hmm. Now, this might uh, present a problem. Uh, the idea of, of uh, funding uh, a program uh, to alleviate the, the hunger uh, 
you know, it's, it's strange. Uh, we get involved in so many humanitarian causes, and yet uh, this whole problem of, of uh, people dying by the thousands in, in an area like this is something that uh, the American people responded to very quickly, and yet mm. when it comes time to, to go into appropriations, uh, it becomes a very difficult chore. Well, you know, I said this um, in my campaign that spending is really not the true measure of compassion. Uh, the true measure of compassion, I'd like to believe, is whether or not the money is getting to the people who really need it. And uh, I go back to my background as a, as a CPA. I think it's time that we, we looked at the programs uh, qualitatively to see which ones are working and which ones are not working uh, to be sure that when Congress appropriates the money, uh, that the money is getting the job done. Uh, too many times uh, we, we talk about the superficial quantitative analysis about what we spent last year, what we think we can afford this year, but are we measuring the effectiveness of these programs to be sure that the money is not wasted? In other words, are we getting a dollar's worth from a dollar's worth of expenditures? Uh, and that's an area that I want to spend more time uh, looking at and uh, perhaps uh, working with the Government Operations Committee and the... Um, the Controller General, by the way, answers to that committee, uh, that's the Government Accounting Office, uh, I can begin to get an understanding as to the way we, how we spend our money. So uh, the issue is we have to help these people, there's no doubt. And poor people especially should never be held hostage to a system of waste. We can't be balancing the books on their backs. We've got to figure out uh, you know why we're in this situation. But it does, it does rec it cost us some money to, to monitor those things too and that's one of the problems that we have found here uh, over the years. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, we do want to, even in, in our programs uh, here in this country, uh, forgetting, I, I shouldn't say forgetting, but uh, uh, looking to other areas and to our own house and keeping our own house in order here, uh, we've had waste in, in a great number of, of the programs that we have had and yet eliminating that waste uh, has not really solved the problem for people who want to really cut uh, the programs out completely. Well, we um, have to do more. I think the Grace Commission, and that name has gone around quite a bit, uh, has given us a roadmap. Now, many people wouldn't believe with $424 billion worth of savings, uh, but certainly you could look at that report of over 2,200 recommendations and come up with 50 or 100 billion dollars worth. And I think it's time for Congress to look at that uh, to be sure that we uh, see what recommendations uh, can be implemented um, uh, quickly and, and do it. Uh, waste is, um, is not easily uncovered, but I think it's a responsibility of people put in a fiduciary position, and that's the way I see my role as a congressman, as a watchdog for the public, uh, as a fiduciary, to be sure that we are uh, uh, husbanding the resources entrusted to mm -hmm. government and the taxes. Uh, and I, I believe that we've got to do a, a better job uh, when it comes to waste. Uh, Mickey, one area that uh, uh, we, you have talked and, and we have seen uh, so many distressing pictures uh, on television and, and, and the like uh, of, of the tragedy uh, of Ethiopia. Uh, this conflict as to whether or not there's hunger in America. Is there hunger in America? Absolutely. There's no question about it. All you have to do, Lester, is if you want to be dramatic and, and, go and, and make a, a, a romantic visit, then go to the uh, Mississippi Delta. There is massive hunger there. Young children are, are suffering from malnutrition, and eventually they'll suffer from mental illnesses, or they'll e either die, that growth will be stunted, uh, all kinds of adverse effects of uh, what hunger brings uh, to uh, people uh, when they're afflicted with it. Uh, you can go right here in the uh, so-called ghettos of Washington, D.C., and see a shortage of food there. You talk to any of the, the uh, people who are deemed as poverty-stricken, and you'll find that uh, throughout this country, hunger is rampant. Uh, in my district, for instance, in one uh, zip code area in which I live, I might add, uh, there were about 116,000 new applicants for the food lines there. Uh, I'm very disturbed about this problem. Houston is supposed to be, by the way, an affluent uh, community, a growing community, and yet uh, so many more people have been added to the uh, poverty rolls and to the How hunger How do you rolls. account for that? I mean, here we have various programs in order to try to help alleviate the, the problem, and yet it continues. 
Well, I was interested in what Joe was saying earlier about uh, the f fiduciary concerns that he has and how it is that we need to look at waste, fraud, and abuse. I think he's absolutely correct that we can't, uh, while we are looking at this waste, fraud, and abuse, we can't throw the baby out with the bath. We have to f provide the opportunities for people to, to survive comfortably and to be able to eat, and particularly our young people, our children, if you will. What has happened, Lester, is that uh, with the budget cuts and the programs that have so advanced uh, our cause in feeding the hungry people of, of this country. Uh, we have suffered uh, from uh, now the reality that uh, many of the people, though they get food stamps, they don't get the food stamps to last them throughout the month. They've cut out some of the subsidized uh, breakfast for children's programs in the public schools and also the lunch programs that we knew that were so vital. It's ironic that it's, it's and it's not a, a democratic uh, overture to the to the public or to the people to say that we ought to do these things. Richard Nixon uh, did well. I mean, of all people, uh, he did very well uh, in, in, with his uh, administrative uh, 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 responsibilities to uh, lobby the Congress to do more in the area of food stamps and feeding the hungry. But now that we've cut so severely those very programs that we need to feed the hungry people, there have been more and more people who have been added to the, to the, uh, the poverty uh, statistics and to the hunger lines. We've got to be careful, too, uh, that we don't institutionalize poverty in this country. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we've got to give people a basic level of subsistence. It, it, it's, uh, it's a bad mark on our society if we can't help people at that level. But shortly after that, the next step is to be sure we get them a job because I believe the real way to help people is to help them help themselves. I uh, believe in what the great philosopher Maimonides said. He said that the highest level of giving, the eighth level, is not to give a man a fish but to teach him how to fish. And I think too many times we're, we're trying to help poor people in this country uh, by giving them checks and what we're doing is we're addicting them to the system and we, gotta see, see, we have to get them off that. We've got to give them their dignity. How do you give them a job? Uh, the, the financial institutions and the businesses of this country are not philanthropic organizations. How, how, do, you, how do you get a job for them? Well, it gets down to growth. Um, there have been programs such as urban enterprise zones, which I supported uh, for my district. I come from a, uh, what most would consider as a very affluent district, Westchester County, and yet we have severe pockets of poverty in Mount uh, Vernon, Yonkers. In fact, that city, the fourth largest city in the, uh, in the state, is in my district, and it's uh, practically a ward of the state right now. It's got an emergency financial control board. It seems to me that we need uh, the incentives to get private capital into these areas to rebuild them uh, and in the process create jobs. Now, that was a federal uh, law that I wanted to see passed, but they work very well at the state level. We have them in Norwalk, Connecticut, Cleveland, Ohio, and Baltimore, Maryland. And you can see that uh, when you start with the, the inner city or the inner um, place that needs to be rebuilt, it creates jobs, it creates new construction, creates business. And uh, I think we've got to look more at these uh, private public sector partnerships to do this. The key is to get people back to work so they feel good about themselves. Because people raise children, and if they're not good role models for those children, what are those children going to be later on? So uh, I agree with everything that is being said. Uh, We've got to keep people from starving. There's no question about that. And uh, you're doing a, a marvelous job on that. But shortly after that, we've got to get people to help themselves at the now, same now, time. Now we're talking now to uh, Congressman Mickey Leland of Texas and Congressman Joe Diogotti of uh, uh, Westchester County, uh, New York. And you were talking about uh, uh, methods of, of uh, bringing the, the private sector uh, into community programs in order to solve some of this problem. Uh, uh, Mickey, what do you think about that? Well, let's, I, I agree with Joe uh, again and w with what he said, but let me okay. add something. In my district, for instance, we have a lot of people who are working, but who are under paid for the jobs that they do. And they can barely eke out a living for themselves and their families. And that's a very serious problem in America. There are people who are working poor who can ill afford to, to buy a lot of the necessities or pay for the, a lot of the goods and services that they need in order to survive comfortably. And that's a problem that we have to address. I agree with Joe that we need to find jobs for those who are the unemployed. We also need programs that develop skills for people, to help them to develop skills. The unskilled, the semi-skilled people need to advance themselves and need to feel comfortable about whether or not they can, in fact, uh, uh, evolve into uh, true uh, contributing 
taxpayers of our, our, our country, productive uh, members of our society, if you will. And one of the things that we need to do, of course, is for the government to step in and say, okay, we are going to provide you with incentives, but we're going to also provide you with other kinds of opportunities. One of the things that I hate that happened was that they did totally away with CETA. We have dissolved CETA now, and there's nothing to really take its place. CETA had all kinds of problems, and I know that. What we needed to do, however, with the concept of CETA, was to revamp CETA to provide for real job training opportunities for our young people in particular, give them an opportunity to learn skills or to at least semi-skills, learn semi-skills, so that they could get jobs where they can make more money than, than just adequate money to, for them, their basic survival. And that represents a real problem, particularly in, in areas like Texas, where we are a relatively affluent state to some extent. Uh, but at the same time, we see so many hundreds of thousands of people who are working poor, who can't, who, who are not lazy people. They need a helping hand from the government. They need a helping hand from those who will. I wish the private sector would do a whole lot more than what they're doing in terms of uh, taking up where government has left off now that we have realize so many budget cuts. You know, one, one aspect of this, uh, when you're talking about people who, who have uh, been unable to make it on the salary that they, they uh, earn, uh, it's, it's not a very commonly known fact uh, that uh, a goodly number of our military today, in the very lower grades, are on welfare. And that is something that uh, has uh, surprised many people. The fact that uh, uh, you have someone who is working in government employment uh, who also has to, to get welfare to keep his family uh, uh, in, in food. Uh, one uh, aspect of this uh, then evolves upon uh, what we're going to do. Here we're talking about the fact that some of the lower grades in our military and military pay uh, are not making it uh, in, in today's uh, uh, society. And uh, we're talking also about uh, cutting a defense budget. Uh, how do we reconcile those things? Very easily. Lester, one of the things that we have not done is gone after waste, fraud, and abuse in the military. If you look at the cost overruns, and by the way, that's a great area for Joe to, to pursue because not enough has been said or done by enough members of Congress uh, in this particular area. We look at the, at the waste, fraud, and abuse in the military, and we're talking about billions upon billions of dollars that have been just totally abused or misused. Uh, these are taxpayers' dollars that we ought, to, we ought to guard very, very, very sacredly, and we don't. We need to go after those those funds. Keep you agreeing. Know. We're going to think you're going to think we're from no, the same you know, party. I, I, <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's a very strange thing here. here. You know, this this is something I don't think the public uh, realizes that once an election is over, although there are, there are party differences, the members of Congress work together in trying to solve the problem. Especially these big problems today, without a bipartisan approach to this budget uh, deficit. Uh, it's just not going to be done the right way, and I agree with Mickey wholeheartedly. Again, I campaign very heavily on a strong defense, but I don't believe a strong defense has to be a spendthrift defense. Exactly. And that's the, the words that I used. And uh, I was shocked to find out in reading the Grace Commission that only 6% of the contracts, the procurement contracts in the military, are competitively bid. Right. What that says is that 94% of the contracts are sole source, uh, are privately arranged deals. Now. I can understand someone saying, well, there's a particular company that has to do this, and no other company can compete with it, but I, there's no business that I know, and I spent 22 years in a major accounting firm, and I've seen a lot of them, that could stand the lack of that kind of price competition. Now, I wouldn't see 100% competitive bidding, but I certainly believe we can raise that 6% to, to 50 or 60%, and maybe 40% of the contracts would be sole source, and that's just a, a, a beginning. Uh, the Grace Commission also said it cost the Army uh, um, $6 to cut a payroll check. Uh, it costs the private sector a dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, the Veterans Administration, it costs them um, over $100 to process an insurance claim. It costs the private sector $6. Uh, so you go on and on with these examples, and uh, one uh, then has to focus on the management of the system. See, we in Congress don't manage the system. We appropriate well, the money. Joe, that's one of the problems that I found uh, in, in 16 years that I spent here. We spend a lot of time here uh, making laws. But the oversight is something that is somewhat neglected. And that's one of the areas. Uh, in fact, we uh, put in an oversight committee uh, into each of the committees of the Congress, uh, which we do have now. But not enough time seems to be spent in that, in checking up on, on the law after it has been enacted. 
I, I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, initiative, I think, will be very well taken. Well, I'll be raising these questions, uh, being part of the Government Operations Committee, uh, Mickey, which I understand is a giant oversight That's committee exactly right. to all government agencies. Uh, these are the, uh, the questions that I'll be raising uh, from my own perspective. Um, as I said, I come from the, the business world. I was very actively involved in my community on charitable boards, president of the Homeowners Association, on the IDA. But this is the first time that I ran for a major office. And I ran uh, with the theme that I would bring a business sense to, to Congress, and uh, here I am. Now, I didn't win you know, with a, a great uh, margin, but I did win, and uh, I hope to build on that. Uh, and, and get the people uh, comfortable with the idea of a, uh, a businessman involved in the legislative process. I, I want you to know that I was known as Landslide Lester. I won by 2,600 votes in my first election and 867 in the second one. <laughs> All I can say is <laughs> well, I, I don't envy you. That. <laughs> <laughs> I don't envy you, Lester. Uh, you have just been elected as the, the chairman of the Black Caucus. Why do we need a Black Caucus? There's still certain concerns in the Congress that uh, we, we have that are very near and dear to people who, with em great empathy for the problems of black people in this country. Uh, we have to guard those interests very carefully. One of the things you must realize, Lester, is that uh, you look at the numbers of members of Congress who are black today, and there are only 20. We have a net loss, as a matter of fact, of one. Mm -hmm. uh, we had 21 last year. This session, we only have 20 people. Something is wrong there. Uh, not necessarily the legislature or the, or the laws uh, embodied in the Congress uh, are the ones that are at fault, but rather what it is that uh, we have to do in order to affect change in this nation. We represent the cutting edge for black people around the country. While we don't purport to represent uh, all of the interests of all black people, we at least raise the priority interests uh, of, of the black community. We also don't want to be known as just black representatives. We represent the entirety of this nation, but we also, re we also understand that the soul of this nation, if you will, uh, must be uh, brought to the forefront in order that uh, people will understand that we have certain plight that has, has been in the last few years ignored, and that is, is that uh, a lot of people have not yet realized uh, their American status. We are still second class citizens to a great extent. We are still uh, citizens who have been uh, forlorn uh, by the system itself. And we have to continue to fight to make sure that America becomes America to all of its people. We fight for the poor and the working people and, and we fight uh, with uh, a great fervor. Uh, but we continually have to raise the interest of black people in this country because we exist at the bottom rung of the ladder. We have not been given our just due, and that's why we have to meet in a caucus to determine what our agenda is, and then to fulfill that agenda, we have to amass uh, our intelligence uh, in a caucus in order that we can leverage the Congress to do what's right. Symbolically, we passed last year the, uh, the Martin Luther King birthday bill. It took years and years, but it had there not been a congressional black caucus to fight that fight for so many years, we never would have convinced the majority members of Congress on both sides of the, the, the Capitol uh, to, to support an, an issue like that. Uh, there have been other issues, the Voting Rights Act, the extension of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Black people have to be here, have to meet in a caucus to determine what their priorities are in order, and until of such time that, that we don't need affirmative action and equal employment opportunity, until we don't need uh, to, to, to fight for the poor when there, there, there are no poor left in this country. I, I know that uh, uh, many of the members of, of Congress have worked with the Black Caucus. I've worked very closely with the Black Caucus over, over the years. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Congressman Diaguati, for being here with us on Ask Congress today. Nice to be here with you, Les. Look forward to being here again. We hope you will come back many times. And, and uh, Mickey Lewin, thank you very much for coming. You get a, 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 an additional perspective to this uh, program, having a Texan on with a New Yorker, you know. <laughs> I like it. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you Good both. combination. Thank you both uh, very much again. Uh, and uh, uh, until next week at the same time, this is Lester Wolf saying so long from Washington.